Well, welcome to another episode of the uh, Scriptural Mormonism Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Bottom, and today we have a special guest, Mike uh, Peter Pan Parker. So uh, we'll be discussing his blog, Neville Neville Land, and a few other things as well. But before we do, um, you know, Mike, you know, this is your first time on the podcast, although you appeared a f- about a year ago in a stream where we and a few others discussed Christology and other fun topics. So yeah, uh, right. perhaps if we were, you were to like give a introduction to yourself, um, who you're, what do you do for a living? Have you always been a Latter-day Saint? What got you interested in Mormon studies? You know, uh, the whole spiel, if you will. Sure. Uh, I uh, was raised uh, a member of the church. My, my father's a convert when I was five years old. My mother was... Um, uh, not active when they married, but became active soon after I was born. Um, I was uh, not, I, I don't think, terribly interested in getting into kind of the deep, you know, deeper issues uh, of the gospel, really, until uh, until about my mission. Um, uh, like a lot of missionaries, uh, at least of my age, I, I remember encountering uh, Truman Madsen's set of uh, talk Eight, eight lectures on the prophet Joseph Smith and uh, was just uh, blown away by that to think, you know, there's so much more to the gospel than, you know, what uh, just the basic things you'd learned in primary and, and Sunday school and seminary and so forth. Um, and that really got me started on, on trying to learn more about some of these uh, more, I don't know if deeper is the right word, but, you know, more technical things. Um I uh, became acquainted with farms while I was on my mission, which was, this is late eighties, early nineties. And they were still fairly, uh, you know, kind of a small operation uh, at that time. But I had some of their photocopied uh, hand up reprints of things. And uh, when I got home from my mission, I uh, found out that they had a, a couple of journals, a journal of book of Mormon studies and the uh, review of books on the book of Mormon. And so I subscribed to those and, uh, ate those up and just started uh, collecting uh, books and reading and and just became really, really interested in uh, learning more about the gospel. And I don't know if I'd consider myself, you know, an, an, an expert or anything like that. I, I, I don't know anybody who is, but I, I guess I'm fairly well informed. Maybe that, how does that sound? Um, that's, I guess that's kind of my background there uh, as far as church-wise. Um, live in Southern Utah. Uh, married, uh, three kids, uh, one daughter at home uh, right now, and uh, uh, work in the uh, cellular industry. Um, so uh, do uh, uh, amplification for cellular uh, signal and, and things like that. So uh, mainly, I don't do the technology or the, the technical end of it, but mainly work on uh, websites and reporting and database and data analysis. And that's a lot of my background is uh, data analysis. I've been doing that for, oh gosh, almost 25 years, I think. Cool. That's a good introduction. Um, so, of course, uh, a while ago, uh, you started, albeit anonymously, uh, a blog called Neville Neville Land. And of yes. course, like um, you were outed, of course, uh, as the proprietor and the uh, um, the Peter Pan of the uh, blog. So we'll discuss some of that. But um, of course, the and of course, in the show notes, I'll include a link to the blog. It's actually very well done. But um, oh, thank you. So so today's episode, we'll actually just be discussing Neville Neville and, and the uh, Richard Nygren affair. So uh, perhaps if we were discuss like, um, you know, the background and the claims of the history of the Heartland movement in general itself. Um, okay. So um Boy, and, and this is one of these subjects where we could we could easily spend two hours talking about, uh, you know, Book of Mormon geography theories and so forth. But here's the shortest version I can give you: um, is that through most of the 19th century, um, most Latter Day Saints, including it's it's fairly evident the the Prophet Joseph and his uh, associates, uh, they believed in a uh, what what we call today a, a hemispheric geography for the Book of Mormon. So. Uh, the land northward is North America. The land southward is South America. The narrow neck of land is the Isthmus of Panama, or what they called Darien at the time. Um, and then starting toward the end of the 19th century, um, Latter-day Saints, and then independently, uh, people in the reorganized church, although there's no evidence that they collaborated or knew of each other's uh, works, began to realize that the Book of Mormon, the action, and it could not have taken place on a, on a continent-wide scale. It's just simply 
too small. The travel times are, are too short for somebody to, to walk from the southern tip of South America to the, the northern end of North America and so forth. And so there began to be developed uh, limited geography theories. And many of the early ones began to center on uh, northern South America and Central America, with particular emphasis on what's called Mesoamerica, which is um, southern Mexico, Guatemala, uh, and that region. Um, the question eventually becomes, well, if that's where the Book of Mormon took place, is that where the Hill Cumorah is located? Uh, the Hill Cumorah being the hill where the Nephites were destroyed, Mormon chapter 6, um, it's also known as Rama to the Jaredites, where they were destroyed. Um, what we call today the Hill Cumorah in New York. Uh, the question then becomes, do we call the Hill Cumorah the Hill Cumorah because it was the Hill Cumorah actually of the Book of Mormon, where the Nephites were destroyed? Or is that a name that was given to it, either on purpose or accidentally, and just kind of stuck? Um, and this was kind of an ongoing discussion for a long time. Um, until in the early 2000s, um, uh, kind of a new movement arose uh, that has come to be known as the Heartland uh, Movement. And the Heartland Movement, and I, I do want to try and be fair to them. Um, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about being the one to uh, explain what someone else believes. That's not my, you know, and, and I want to try to steel man their argument as much as possible. Um, the Heartland Movement, the, there were people who were involved in that kind of early on, who were pushing for sort of a New York-based geography of the Book of Mormon. Uh, probably the best known person is Wayne May. Um, but in the mid 2000s, uh, individual by the name of Rodney Meldrum, Rod Meldrum, uh, came out with a DVD lecture series called DNA Evidence for Book of Mormon Geography. Uh, and this was 2008, in which he made his case for uh, the Book of Mormon taking place in the heartland of America. And by heartland, I mean pretty much the Midwest. So uh, the extent of it is going to be uh, Western New York in one corner, uh, Southern Illinois, Iowa in the other corner, and then from there stretching south down to the Gulf of Mexico. With the city of Zarahemla being on the Mississippi River, which Meldrum and other Heartlanders argue is the River Sidon, uh, being on the opposite side of the river from modern day Nauvoo. And that's based on their interpretation of Doctrine and Covenants 125 verse three, uh, which was a revelation to Joseph telling him to name the city across the Mississippi River from Nauvoo to call it Zarahemla. And they interpret that to mean that Joseph was giving it this name because that was its ancient name. Um, and then uh, with, of course, the Hill Cumorah being the hill in New York. That's the, 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 they insist upon that, that the Hill Cumorah in New York has to be the Hill Cumorah of the Book of Mormon. Um, in addition to that, uh, Rod Meldrum's presentation uh, also had what he argues is uh, DNA evidence for uh, Native Americans, particularly Native Americans of the American Northeast, being related to people of the Middle East and showing that, so there's that DNA connection and therefore they are descendants of Lehi and so forth. Um, and then he came out with a book uh, three years later, probably his best known book is Exploring Book of Mormon in America's Heartland, and uh, uh, which he lays out many of these same arguments. And since then he's gone on to uh, publish some other things. He does a, a semi-annual conference in the Salt Lake area uh, where he gets together speakers and 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 so forth. Um, more to the point of this discussion, uh, one of the other leading figures in the the Heartland movement, particularly when it comes to Book of Mormon geography and and some other uh, uh, related issues, is Jonathan Neville. Uh, Jonathan Neville is a retired attorney. Um, he is the author of many many books. Uh, the first one on the Book of Mormon, that, at least that I'm aware of is a book that he published in 2015 called The Lost City of Zarahemla. And to the best of my knowledge, he's published a new book, uh, and these are self-published. They're through Digital Legend, which is a self-publishing outfit. And there's there's nothing wrong with self-publishing. I'm just saying that it's not going through a Deseret book or anything like that, where there's a, a long editorial review process. Publishing a book is 
it takes a long time to do that. If you self-publish, you can, you can churn things up pretty quick if you're a, a fast writer. And I, I believe that he is. Um, so he's published a lot of other books uh, following up on this. Uh, Moroni's America is probably the biggest one and the one that, that kind of got me started uh, on, on blogging about him. Because in Moroni's America, which was published in 2016, he argued for a, a very specific geography uh, based around the heartland. So he was able to identify various spots in the American Midwest and line them up with Book of Mormon places. Uh, there's also a follow-up book to this that was written by uh, Ryan Nelson, uh, who is also another heartlander, and then edited by Jonathan Neville called Moroni's America Maps Edition. That, that's a color uh, spiral-bound book that shows all of the things from Moroni's America, but it's overlaid on U.S. maps. Um, he's gone on to publish a lot of other books, including uh, most recently, probably his two best known books are A Man That Can Translate uh, from 2020 and Infinite Goodness, which is his book about uh, Jonathan Edwards, who supposedly, according to Neville, had uh, uh, influence, his writings had influence on how the Book of Mormon, the wording of the Book of Mormon, that's from 2021. Um, so that's kind of the background of the Heartland movement. Uh, if you want, we can kind of shift into there. You know, what, what, what are Jonathan Neville's specific claims? Is that maybe where uh, we can go next? Or did you oh, have no, any no, yeah. questions or comments? Oh, no, no. Uh, I'm just going to note, like in the show notes alongside the uh, blog, Neville Neville Land, I'll include the link to my interview with Spencer Krauss um, yes. about, about just under a year ago, where Spencer gave a review, um, an overview of his responses to um, Neville on the issue of the use of seer stones and some other topics as well so but if you want to like uh, go into like ne jonathan neville specific things because he does have like um some interesting uh perspectives such as the um demonstration hypothesis for the seer stone and the urim and tumim and other issues as well so if you want to like yeah. uh, give an overview of that um sure please go ahead and, and again i'm not him he's not here so uh, i want to really try to do justice to his beliefs and again i'll use the term steel man rather than straw man um, his argument. And if I'm, if I misstate anything, uh, uh, please, if you're aware of it, please correct me. And if there's, if I'm say something that you don't catch, that's, that's not accurate. I would hope that there will be comments uh, in, in YouTube and I would be more than happy to, to issue a retraction or a correction uh, on my blog. So um, Jonathan Neville has a number of issues that are important to him. Obviously he's an active member of the church. Um, uh, believes very much in the church. He served a, a, a mission, he and his wife, uh, as a couple missionary uh, not long ago, um, and has, uh, and I believe now, right now, teaches the, uh, the do they call them, the, what are the names of the courses that they came out with a, a few years ago? Um, they, I could call them cornerstone courses or something like that. They're, they're taught through BYU and BYU-Idaho. I, I can't remember the exact name of them, but they're, they're foundational classes in in church history and, and doctrine. Um, but with uh, among his own writings, what he seems to focus on is a handful of specific issues where he disagrees with what I will call, and I hope this is a fair term, mainstream Latter-day Saint scholarship uh, on these issues. Um, so I think that his number one issue for the longest time has been that there is only one Hill Cumorah, that the Hill Cumorah in New York is the Hill Cumorah of Mormon chapter six, where the Nephites were uh, were wiped out. Um, and for him, that is completely non-negotiable. Uh, from his point of view, uh, he insists that uh, everyone in early Latter-day Saint history, all the leaders and up to and including uh, most recently uh, Marion G. Romney in the 1970s, has affirmed that, that there's one Hill Kimura. Um, and in that, from that standpoint, he's not incorrect. There hasn't been a lot of discussion from general authorities about, uh, could there be two Kimuras? There are some uh, private notes that have been written in uh, inside books and journals and so forth by general authorities who questioned, you know, could this be, uh, could there be two different Kimuras? Um, I'm thinking of Johnny Witso in the 1950s, um, kind of, you know, just put a question mark behind this. Uh, Harold B. Lee, in a, in a book that was discovered in a bookstore, had written some notes in the margins saying, you know, are there two Kimuras? But, you know, 
he's on fairly solid ground there, I'd have to say, as far as appealing to, yes, general authorities have said there's only one Kamara. And that's fine. Uh, the question, of course, becomes, do these general authorities know that there's only one Kamara because there's a revelation? Or are they just kind of assuming that there's one Kamara? And we can get into that in more detail a little bit later on, if you'd like. So that that's a major issue for him. Um, related to that is his uh, geography of the Book of Mormon. I honestly do not believe that he's married to that geography. I think it's mainly he's just throwing ideas out there as a hypothesis that if better ideas came along, he would probably accept them. At least that's my understanding. Um, and then also related to the one Kimura idea is uh, his belief that there are there was not one set of plates that Joseph Smith received from which he translated the Book of Mormon. Um, the, the, the main understanding among most Latter-day Saints is that Joseph Smith received one set of plates that were you know, six inches by eight inches. Two thirds of them were sealed and that Joseph translated the entire Book of Mormon from the remaining one third part that was not sealed. Um, uh, Jonathan Neville argues that there are two sets of plates, uh, a set of plates that he had in Harmony and then another set of plates that he had in Fayette and that uh, the angel Moroni took the harmony plates, is what he calls them, back to the Hill Cumorah in New York uh, while Joseph was traveling from Harmony to Fayette. And then the angel Moroni supposedly uh, placed those in this cave full of plates that's under the Hill Cumorah. And then he retrieved what Neville calls the Fayette plates, brought them to Fayette, gave them to Joseph, and, and so forth. Uh, this is, a, I, I don't think this is really central to his, his arguments. Uh, it's based on a, a late recollection of David Whitmer, um, who said that he, he ran into a divine being who said that he was on his way to Kimura. Um, So I, again, I, don't, I think it's a major issue, but it is related to this, his one Kimura in, insistence. Um, his other big issue, uh, and this may even... Well, I don't think it eclipses the the one Kimura, but it's it's probably on the same level. Um, is his insistence that Joseph Smith never used any object to translate the Book of Mormon except for the Nephite interpreters, which Jonathan Neville insists is the only objects that we can call Urim and Thummim. Um, that Joseph used the breastplate. He had the uh, the Ermethumim in the spectacles, that he looked through those and he looked at the plates. Um, and then from there, um, his ideas about how actually Joseph translated are kind of interesting, but you already talked about that with Spencer Krauss. So I don't want to go through, um, retread that, but but it's related to, to this. Um, he insists that Joseph Smith never used a seer stone, never placed a seer stone in a hat, never buried his face in a hat. Uh, to translate the Book of Mormon. This is purely from the Ermin Thummim, and this is his uh, conclusion based on the testimony of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, who in the 1830s both wrote that Joseph translated by the means of the Ermin Thummim that were found with the plates. And Joseph and Oliver never mentioned a Sir Stone. Now, I think there are some significant problems with that assertion. And again, we can get into that as well, but I wanted to just kind of lay out what I think those are his major uh, issues. Another one is related to that, and that's the the Jonathan Edwards' uh, uh, his text, his writings had influence on Joseph's use of language when he translated the Book of Mormon. But again, uh, you already went into that with Spencer Krauss. So uh, I think that's probably about it, and I hope I was accurate and fair. No, that's a pretty good overview of Neville and his claims. So that's an overview of his claims. So like, why did you specifically become like a, a bit worried, uh, if you will, about Jonathan Neville and his writings? You know, uh, are these innocent claims or do you think like uh, they're just like uh, dead wrong? Why did you actually decide to set up a blog um, interacting with and critiquing some of these uh, perspectives, you know? Why did I just set a set up a blog? You know, I ask myself that question every day. Um, <laughs> I don't remember when I first encountered Jonathan Neville's writings. I'm the the blog first went up in February of 2019, so obviously it was before then, and probably at least a year before that, maybe longer. Um, I had been aware of 
uh, things that Jonathan Neville was writing. Um, he maintains several blogs. Uh, MoronizeAmerica.com is kind of the, the core or flagship blog. He cross posts everything on that. So if you don't read any of his other, and, and you know, sometimes the number of blogs, it fluctuates. I've seen as many as, you know, in the high twenties, I don't think they're all active though. Uh, but he has other blogs where he addresses specific issues. Uh, one called Book of Mormon Central America, where he, he, he kind of, uh, takes Book of Mormon Central to task on, on things that they publish or, or believe in. Uh, he has another blog called Interpreter Peer Reviews, where he is critical of the uh, Interpreter Foundation and its publications. Um, but everything gets mainly published on ronasamerica.com. And at some point, I became familiar with him and I began reading what he was writing. And my initial impression was that he makes certain arguments but in order to get to the conclusion that he wants to get to, um, two things have to happen. One is that he has to ignore or discount a lot of evidence and testimony, eyewitness testimony, that he doesn't agree with. Uh, and we can go into more detail on that in a moment as well. Um, the second thing is, is that he makes implied accusations that I, I don't even know if he is following through in his own mind to their logical conclusion. So let me give you, well, you know what, we probably have to do a little bit more background before I can get to examples of that. Uh, but that's that, that's initially what, what concerned me was I, I read these things and I'm like, there's, this is not this is not being argued well, because there are things that are being excluded and there are implications to these arguments that are not, that don't go down a road that I think he even wants to go down uh, as far as, you know, questioning, you know, what's going on at church headquarters and so forth. And again, we'll, we'll get into this in, in just a bit. Um, but it, it got to the point where I was reading what he was writing and it, you know, maybe it's just my OCD or something where, I just kind of felt like this is something that needs a, a response. It needs a review. Uh, it, people need to understand what it is that he's claiming and what the implications are of what he's arguing. And, you know, I thought about writing a blog and honestly, I think I, I was probably a little bit impulsive when I did this. Um, I have to confess that I got the name for the blog, Neville Neville Land from uh, someone else who had mentioned it uh, just in, in passing. Uh, and so I, I shamelessly stole that. Um, but I registered the URL, nevilleneveland.com. And of course, being a play on the 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 book and the setting uh, for Peter Pan. Uh, Peter Pan, he comes and visits uh, Wendy and her brothers in, in London, but he doesn't live there. He lives in Never Neverland, which is a an, an island in, in this... A fantasy place and everyone has to fly if you've seen the the disney movie from the 50s i mean i mean you know what we're talking about or maybe a play or some other adaptation of it and you know i just thought that that was a very clever pun and so when i first set up the blog i thought you know what let's go with a um a, i'll blog under a pseudonym I'll, I'll blog under the name peter pan rather than blogging under my own name because you know at first i thought it was funny just it kind of fit with the which is the overall theme. And if you go to the blog, you'll see the whole thing is laid out. It's in Peter Pan green. It's got uh TikTok, the, the, the crocodile at the bottom and the footer. Um, I, you know, there's just, I, I don't know, maybe I went overboard with it. Um, but at least initially my, my thought was, I, you know, this was going to be a lark, you know, something I was going to do for, I don't know, six months or I, you know, I had no idea. I didn't think long-term on this. I didn't sit down with a piece of paper and let go. Okay. What am I going to do? What's my, what's my end goal here? I just wanted to get some ideas out there. And then it ended up turning out to be what is now a four-year endeavor. Uh, I've taken some breaks here and there uh, for a couple of months where I just, I feel kind of burned out and then, you know, he'll come back around and, and he'll blog something and it'll just kind of get under my skin and I'll just go, hold on a second. There's something not right about this. And I'll, jump in and then I'll start blogging again. Um, so I, you know, I didn't really have any intentions or, or long-term, there's no goal here. Um, it was just, you know, I wanted to get out my thoughts and, and share some of my concerns. 
Yeah, I can sympathize because like when I set up my blog uh, in August 2014, I actually just felt like it, my enthusiasm would fizzle out after a few weeks, you know. Oh, um, yeah. So, you know, uh, 8,500 plus posts later and almost nine years later, not so much. So I uh, I understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you talk about OCD, I, I mean, yeah, no, you're prolific. And I think I've got about 300 and... 60 ish or so. Oh, uh, well, last four years. you so may I, have I got, OCD, I but I have, I, I have major <laughs> OCD, so it kind of helps. But especially my job at the moment, uh, it, it's a, it's a superpower. But, um, so that's, I think that's a good overview. So, uh, you, maybe if we were to like offer like some, if you were to offer some of your criticisms of Neville and his arguments, um, of course, like when it comes to Spencer Cars, I think has done a very good job of interacting and critiquing uh, Neville when it comes to the whole issue of seer stones and all that, including his demonstration yeah. hypothesis. And he's claimed that Jonathan Edwards influenced the language of the Book of Mormon, which I'll be blunt. I've read both uh, the Book of Mormon and the works of Jonathan Edwards, and that's just, it's nonsense. Um, but uh, maybe when it comes to say, some of these issues about, say, Book of Mormon geography, like um, the Juan Camorra thesis, the Heartland model itself, and maybe also some of his comments about like church leadership, which is kind of um, a bit um, problematic, shall we say. Okay. Um, so Book of Mormon geography. Now, I, I do want to state right off the bat here. Um, I am not necessarily married to any particular Book of Mormon geography. I, I find myself persuaded by the uh, limited Mesoamerican geography with the Hill Camorra of Mormon 6 being somewhere in Southern Mexico. Uh, I'm not uh, particularly hard and fast on any one Mesoamerican geography, because, and there are many of them. There's not just not just a Mesoamerican geography. There are lots of different Mesoamerican geographies. Um, having said that, though, I do not believe that uh, this is an issue of uh, salvation, uh, an issue of faithfulness. I believe that anyone can believe the Book of Mormon took place anywhere. The, the only requirement that has been laid down by modern church leaders is found in the gospel topics essay on book of mormon geography which just says the only thing that we affirm and i'm paraphrasing uh, is that the book of mormon took place somewhere in the americas the western hemisphere so book of mormon geographies that are in africa or malaysia uh, and so forth and there are, they do exist um those are non-starters we're, we're not going to go there um beyond that though um, I, and to the best of my knowledge, other people who are Mesoamericanists uh, and people who know a lot more about Mesoamerican archaeology and anthropology than I do, are completely open to the Book of Mormon taking place anywhere. Um, if it happened to be that it was in South America, great. If it happened to be in the heartland of America, fantastic. The direction that I take, though, and I think where most other, I can't speak for others, but I, I would say it's probably fair to say that most people who are Mesoamericanists. Uh, the the for us the the issue is bring the evidence. If the evidence is compelling that there was an ancient civilization uh, that existed during the time of the Book of Mormon in this area that fits the description of the Book of Mormon as far as uh, size of the population, they had writing, they had highways and and trade. Uh, they had warfare um, and so forth. And then just the, the basic layout of the uh, of the Book of Mormon, which is you have a northern area that's at a lower elevation where the Nephites lived after, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking right now. Who took the Nephites uh, north uh, was, uh, this is in the Book of Omni. Anyway, I'm sorry. Sometimes when my brain does this, it just shuts off. Uh, great prophet. Anyway, things got so bad in the southern lands that he left and took them up and the, he, they encountered the people of Zarahemla, uh, the Mulekites, and they joined up. And so by the end of the Book of Omni, beginning of the Book of Mosiah, you have the Nephites and who have incorporated the Mulekites or the people of Zarahemla into their group. And they live in this northern land that's at a lower elevation than where the Lamanites live, which is in a southern area that has a higher elevation. So it's the Book of Mormon is very consistent about this, that whenever you go from Zarahemla to the land of the Lamanites, which is the land of Nephi, because that's where Nephi first lived, 
you always go up from Zarahemla. And when you go from the land of Nephi to Zarahemla, you always go down to Zarahemla. It's never confused on that point. So it's very, very clear uh, that that's what's going on here. And there's no way to, to reverse those and say, well, up has to mean north. Well, that's a modern concept. So as long as you can come up with a geography that matches that and then come up with an anthropological, archaeological argument that it took place in this area because here's where the people were and we have cities and so forth, I am completely open to the Book of Mormon taking place anywhere, including uh, Zarahemla being across from uh, the Mississippi River from, uh, from Nauvoo. The problem that I have is that I don't think the evidence is compelling at all. Um, the geography that has been set forth simply does not work uh, for the Heartlanders. Uh, and I'll give you just one example. We could go into others if you want to. Uh, one of the biggest problems is the River Sidon. Uh, the River Sidon is the only, to the best of my knowledge, it's the only river that's named in the Book of Mormon. It is a major geographical feature of the Book of Mormon. Uh, it cuts through the land of Zarahemla. And the Book of Mormon says that the head of the Sidon was up a way toward the, where the Lamanites lived near the Nephite city of Manti. So it's south of Zarahemla, higher in the highlands. And I have an entire blog post about this, by the way, about the River Sidon. And it's very, very clear. If you read the Book of Mormon and you pay attention to what it says about the River Sidon, it's very clear that the River Sidon flows north from the Nephite highlands where its head or source is down past Manti, past Zarahemla, and then it empties into the sea. Um, Heartlanders argue that since the Sidon is the Mississippi, and I believe that that's a a, a backwards argument that they made the conclusion first that the Mississippi has to be the Sidon and then they're trying to get the evidence to fit it. That they argue that the Sidon flows to the south because of course the Mississippi flows to the south. Well, how do we explain that the head of the river was uh, near Manti, which is south of Zarahemla? Well, they go to very creative lengths to, to try to redefine the word head to mean confluence. So they believe that the head of the river is where the Ohio River and the Mississippi River come together. So it's south of Zarahemla, so the river flows to the south, goes down past Manti, and then Ohio and Mississippi Rivers come together. Well, could it be possible that the word head could mean confluence? I suppose it could, but the problem is that the Book of Mormon itself defines what the head of a river is. In Nephi's vision, or I'm sorry, Lehi's vision, uh, Nephi had the same vision later, but Lehi's vision it talks about the river that he saw in his dream and that the head or source of that river was off here in this uh, uh, this field, this great and great field. Well, it's very, very clear that head means source there. So if you're going to argue that head means something different, you got to be more creative than just saying, well, no, that it, it, it means confluence. So the, the geography just doesn't really work out here. Also, the Mississippi River, of course, flows to the south because the southern United States is at a lower elevation than these rolling hills in the in the Midwestern Plains. So again, you have a problem with the southern highlands of the Lamanites, supposedly being Kentucky, Arkansas, which are there hills and mountains in there? Yeah, but they're not overall, you know, there's not a huge difference in elevation we're talking about here. And the Mississippi River flows south because it's draining into the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So that's one big issue. There, there's lots of other ones. Uh, the the Sea West, according to uh, Neville's maps, is it's actually two different seas. It's Lake Michigan, which is east of Zarahemla, not west. And it's also the Mississippi River, River which supposedly flooded up farther than you know up into uh modern day louisiana and, and created sort of an, a big gulf or inlet there and that's also the sea west so he's got two sea wests both of which are east of zarahemla um it, you know and, and it just it goes on from there there's just lots and lots and lots of issues where if you look at the text and you read it carefully it just doesn't fit inside the heartland of america and in order to get it to fit my 
argument is, or maybe it's an assertion, not really an argument, is that what Neville and other Heartlanders have tried to do is metaphorically tried to shove a square peg into a round hole, that they decided ahead of time that the Hill Cumorah in New York is the Hill Cumorah of the Book of Mormon. The city of Zarahemla is across the river from, uh, from modern day Nauvoo. And once you've got those two things established, well, then we have to create a geography that fits our predetermined conclusion. And that's always a problem whenever you try to do any kind of academic or scientific or scholarly endeavor is you can't let your conclusion drive your research and your evidence. You have to form a hypothesis. You then test the hypothesis. Does it fit? And if it doesn't fit, you discard it and restate your hypothesis. Well, they're just, they've gone from conclusion to, to testing it. And then it doesn't match well, but we're going to go, we're going to stick with the conclusion anyway. And we're going to double down on it and assume that it's absolutely correct. So I, you know, honestly, I don't care um, if they want to believe that took place, the Book of Mormon took place in the heartland. This is a very long-winded way of getting to the point that you asked, what is my problem then? My problem is not so much with their geography, even though I disagree with it. My problem is that Jonathan Neville and other Heartlanders, they assert that if you do not believe that the Hill Cumorah in New York is the one and only Hill Cumorah of the Book of Mormon, that you are, to use a phrase that Jonathan Neville repeats endlessly, rejecting the teachings of the prophets because they believe that Joseph Smith knew by revelation that the Hill Cumorah in New York is the Hill Cumorah and that he taught that. And therefore, if you don't believe it, if you believe that it was in say Southern Mexico or any other place, um, that you are rejecting his teachings. And the arguments and evidence for that are very, very slim. And you really have to kind of twist things to get them to say what you want them to say. Uh, any statements that, uh, for example, that Moroni told Joseph Smith that the name of the hill was Camorra, those statements are all late and secondhand, meaning they don't come at the time of, you don't see them in the early 1830s. The earliest that they show up is at the 1840s, after Joseph is dead. And they're from secondhand witnesses, people who supposedly heard it from Joseph. Um, most, uh, the biggest example being his mother. She wrote her uh, the, the biography of her son, 1844, 1845. And in there, she quotes uh, Moroni calling this hill in New York, the Hill Camorra. Well, this is a real problem because she did not speak to Moroni herself. Um, and we are... 20 years after the fact. Now, you know, I want you to think back 20 years. Can you remember the details of any conversation that you had? Can you remember anybody specifically saying things? It's, you know, real academics, real scholars, real historians, they treat those kinds of claims with a lot of circumspection. They're not going to just take them at face value. They're going to say, well, rightly so, I believe. Mother Smith, bless her heart, was doing her best, but she called that hill Camorra and believe that Bro and I said that because that's what it's been called for the last 20 years. Neville insists on the other hand that no, Mother Smith is directly quoting Joseph. She heard it from him. Joseph said it. I believe that that settles it. Um, they also take other um, pieces of uh, church history like Joseph on the Zion's camp march, they they stop and they find a, uh, a, a skeleton. And he there are six different accounts and they all vary slightly in their details, but it seems pretty clear that Joseph identified the skeleton as a man named Zelf and that he was a white Lamanite who died in battle serving under a general named um, Odin Degas. And so they take this as, no, this is revelation. And in fact, there's even a, a painting that's been done uh, by a Heartlander, it sold. Uh, I, well, I, I I don't know if it's sold. I can't I can't state that, but I have seen it on their website of uh, Joseph Smith, uh, you know, holding up 
you know, uh, objects in his hand and he's there with the, the bones are being in the background and he's kind of got this sort of look on his face like he's receiving divine revelation about about Zelf. And there's there just isn't any evidence from any of the accounts that Joseph received revelation that this was the case. It, uh, is it possibly did? Sure. But, you know, you're kind of going on thin evidence here if you're going to assert that, you know, this for them kind of becomes a major touchstone, that this is how we know the Book of Mormon took place. And, and Joseph, he writes to Emma during the Zion's Camp March that we're walking across the plains of the Nephites. Well, there's no evidence that Joseph received any revelation that said that. It's clear that he believed it. But then Joseph believed that the Book of Mormon took place across the entire North and South American continent. So, you know, he's it's not really evidence of anything other than what he what he believed. But then again, according to Jonathan Neville, if you don't accept that, you are rejecting the teachings of the prophets. And that's where I draw the line, is when you or anybody try to come down and say, if you agree with me in how to interpret Joseph Smith, therefore, you're on the right side. You believe Joseph was right. But if you don't believe the way that I do, you don't interpret things the same way that I do. You believe that Joseph was wrong. And in an email communication that I had with Jonathan Neville earlier this week, he actually tried to box me in with that, tried to say, ultimately, you believe Oliver Cowdery was wrong, don't you? Because Oliver Cowdery said that it was, uh, he, he sat by the Hill Camorra and he wrote the, this early history of the church, 1834, says, you know, sitting here, just kind of dwelling on the fact that this was the last battle place of the Nephites and, and so forth. Well, how did Oliver Cowdery know it was a fact? Did he receive it by revelation or did he just assume it? You know, I think it's very reasonable to assert that he just assumed it like everybody else did. You know, that's where the plates were found. That must be where they died. Even though the Book of Mormon doesn't say that, even though the Book of Mormon says, Moroni says, uh, after his father and everyone else, all the other Nephites said, had died, he said, I wander whithersoever I can for the safety of my own life. Well, apparently he wandered and came right back to where, you know, Lamanite Central, where, where everybody got killed. Um, it seems much more likely to me that he wandered away from the Hill Camorra of the Book of Mormon and came to the hill after 30 years of wandering, that he came to the hill uh, in New York where he buried those plates, and that hill was either named in honor of the hill where the Nephites died, or was just assumed to be that hill and then given that name. Um, but that, and that's very a very long-winded answer to your question. And I'm sorry, and I hope that I put, oh, haven't no. put anybody to sleep. Oh, no, that's but fine. That's really the issue, is yeah. it's not what you claim, it's that it, it, he's claiming that if you don't believe what he believes, that you're rejecting the teachings of the prophets. And that is a huge issue. And then there's there's more to this that we can, if you, if you I'll, I'll, I'll give you some time and then we can. Oh, no, no, just, uh, problems just, with this. just because you mentioned self. Um, Please. I, I do have to plug the, um, research article and research work on self um, on mormonor.org, aka the B.H. Roberts Foundation, where like all mm -hmm. the documents are transcribed and um, scanned. So uh, yeah, it's it's probably the best resource in itself, although I am biased, I do work for them, but I just have to throw in that plug if you don't mind. Uh, but, I have um, to agree with you, by the way. Oh, thank it, you. It's very comprehensive. I, I appreciate you guys for putting that up. It's fantastic. Oh, thanks for that. But um, it also seems like based on, like, say, some of Neville writings and some of your interactions, he seems to believe that modern church leaders um, have been influenced by this evil cabal, if you will, of, like, um, a lot of modernist thinking and stuff like that. So, and for me, that seems to be, like, very akin to, like, say, a lot of um, conspiracy theory-minded traditional Catholics who I knew who believe the Vatican was infiltrated by modernists. Um, I'm from Ireland, if you haven't guessed. But, um, so that kind of seems like a very precarious um, situation he seems to be like uh, trying to portray church leaders in and so forth. So if you maybe were to comment on that and why obviously it's uh, pretty dangerous. Yeah, so this gets back to the earlier point that I had made that uh, one of my concerns is, um, concern number one is, is not so much as geography and his claims, but that if you don't agree with him, that you disagree with Joseph and Oliver and you reject the prophets. The second problem that I have is the implications of what he says, because he either mildly implies or sometimes strongly implies that what that there's kind of a dark conspiracy that's going on here. Now, the phrase dark conspiracy is not his. That's that's my 
uh, my phrase. I, I want to be fair to him. I, I don't think that he, to the best of my knowledge, has ever used the term conspiracy. But when you look at what's going on within his arguments, I believe that that word fits what is is happening. So what Jonathan Neville argues is, obviously the heartland geography and use of the Ermenthal Mum and never the seer stone is not taught by today's church. Um, if the church is completely geographic neutral, there's been a lot of publications in church magazines over the years, particularly uh, 1984, John L. Sorensen had a, a series uh, published in the Ensign about Mesoamerican sites. There's been lots of other uh, things. The, the Book of Mormon, uh, the printed edition for missionaries from 19 early 1960s up to 1981, uh, it had the angel Moroni on the cover, the light blue cover, kind of a sky with a golden angel Moroni top of a temple. Uh, if you open that up, it had a set of photographs in it of uh, sites, uh, many places in, in, in America, including South America, but it had pictures of Mesoamerican temples and Mesoamerican murals and so forth. So this notion that the, the Book of Mormon took place in Mesoamerica, uh, you know, it's a longstanding concept. I, I think it's, I would say it's universal among Latter-day Saints. I, I think a lot of Latter-day Saints have not really thought too deeply about it, but those who have, a lot of them have come down on a Mesoamerican geography. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm getting, I, I do have a point. I, I'm I'm getting around to it, <laughs> going the wrong, the long way around to get to it. Um, but we have times and seasons in 1842, specifically talking about Mesoamerican sites. And again, this is a whole thing where Jonathan Neville tries to dismiss that and say, Joseph Smith had nothing to do with that, that this was a uh, guy by the name of Benjamin Winchester who was trying to throw Joseph under the bus. And uh, it's it's a very weird, I, I think, argument to make, um, especially from based on the historical evidence that Joseph was the editor of the paper, that he was at the Times and Seasons printing office uh, during those months and so forth. Um, all right, so getting back to the, the point. Um, clearly, the church today is not teaching a heartland geography. We haven't seen any direct affirmation from leaders of the church that there is a only one Kimura since Marion G. Romney in, I believe it's 1977 or 76 general conference. Um, Jonathan Neville has actually made a big deal about that and said that, hey, no one's talking about this. Um, I have a blog post about that. But so the question is, why? Why doesn't the church come out and say, oh, and, and then, of course, the, the seer stone uh, a couple of years ago, I don't remember the exact date, I apologize, uh, the church published the Ensign, former magazine for adults for the, for the church. This was the cover photo was Joseph Smith's brown seer stone with two articles on the inside, one of them written by Richard Turley, who was a member of the 70 and church historian at the time, talking about the seer stone and how Joseph Smith used it to, to translate the Book of Mormon. Uh, so clearly the church is leaning hard into Joseph used the seer stone to translate and not coming down on geography at all, but certainly not leaning in the direction that Jonathan Neville and Heartlanders are. So why is that? Well, Jonathan Neville has claimed, and, and I think this is one of the things that really got me started on this blog, is that there is what he refers to as a, as a cartel. And he's argued that, that he doesn't mean that in a negative sense. And I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he means just a, a group that's, you know, they control everything, but they're not, uh, he doesn't necessarily mean it in an evil sense, like, you know, like a, a drug cartel or something like that. But he claims that there is a cartel of scholars, historians, church employees um, who are all on the side of what he calls M2C, Mesoamerica, two Camorras, and what he calls Sith, which stands for stone in the hat. Um, that acronym is a little bit too on the nose. And in my view, I think it's fairly obvious that he knows that he's using it because it has these dark sinister implications with, you know, Star Wars, Darth Vader is the dark Lord of the Sith, right? So he refers to the stone in the hat as the Sith. Um, so that he believes that these scholars, academics, church employees are kind of gatekeepers that are shielding 
the brethren from either being told about the Heartland movement or, you know, hearing convincing arguments about the Heartland movement. And therefore, what you get from the church is uh, Seer Stone being published in The Ensign and a Gospel Topics essay on Book of Mormon translation that's all about the Seer Stone and a uh, Book of Mormon a Gospel Topics essay about Book of Mormon geography that's very neutral and tells people, you know, quit arguing about these things. Um, that all of this is coming from people who are not the leaders of the church, but who kind of surround them and protect them. And I hope that I'm describing his argument correctly. If I'm if I'm not, I, I would I would appreciate hearing uh, from him if he could articulate something succinct about that. So the problem with that is, so this leads to one of two conclusions, which he doesn't address, but I think that the implication is very clear if you follow his assertions through to their logical conclusion, is that the brethren either A, know that the Book of Mormon took place in the heartland and that Joseph Smith didn't use a seer stone, and they are completely asleep at the switch and allowing false information to be published through church magazines, church curriculum, church website. Or B, the brethren do believe that Joseph used a seer stone and so forth. And, and by the brethren, I mean today's leaders of the church. And therefore, they're on the camp that Joseph, or that, that I'm sorry, that Jonathan Neville argues is rejecting the teachings of the prophets. So which is it? It, it, it? I can't think of a third alternative. They either are stupid or they're evil. That's the, the logical conclusion here. And so the only way that he can get around this is by simply not talking about it. And I've made this point multiple times on the blog is, okay, here's the implication of this. And he refuses to address it, partly because he doesn't read my blog. He he told me in an email, he says, I, I don't read your blog. It's full of um, it's full of ad hominem arguments. And I responded to him and I said, well, if you don't read my blog, how do you know it's full of ad hominem arguments? <laughs> but I'll, 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 let me give you one example and then I'll, I'll kind of finish up this section with this and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, back in uh, June, uh, yes, June of 2020. And I can provide a, a link to this if you want on his blog, Book of Mormon, Central America.com. He wrote this. And the first part of this is a quote, quote, the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history, unquote. That's a quote from George Orwell, and he actually cites George Orwell. George Orwell, of course, being the author of uh, the book 1984 about this dystopian future society where uh, whatever the history is, it's whatever the party wants it to be today. And anything that was published before, well, that gets destroyed and the new history is published, and the the uh, the protagonist of the book, Winston Smith, he works in the Ministry of Truth, and his job is to go through old magazines and art, newspaper articles and find things where the party claimed, you know, that this was happening and this was happening, and you know, we're we're making advances in the war on the Malabar Front and in our war against uh, East Asia. Well, now we're not fighting a war against East Asia; we're actually fighting a war against Eurasia. And so he takes those old newspaper articles, he throws them down the memory hole where they're burned, and then he types out a new replacement article. Well, that's what George Orwell is claiming. So, getting back to the quote here, he quotes George Orwell: "The most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history." And then Neville himself, immediately after that, says, "Despite the Gospel Topics essay on translations and the ensign." There is still at least one page on the church's website that claims Joseph Smith translated the plates with the Urim and Thummim. And he gives a link to a page in history.churchofjesuschrist.org that talks about Joseph translated with the Urim and Thummim. And then he finishes with, let's see how long that stays up. Now, he doesn't go any farther with this, but it's really clear, I think, to anybody who can you know, make basic connections that what he's arguing here or at least asserting, is that the people who work for church curriculum and church magazines and on the church website are basically like Winston Smith, that they are shooting, they're firing things down the memory hole and replacing it with information that is acceptable to the M2C and the Sith factions. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I called them out on this, you know, that is this, is, is this really what's going on in church curriculum? Is it the church curriculum is now the ministry of truth? Because that's, that's the implication here. You know, he just, he, he steps right up to that line, but he doesn't go there. But that's obviously what he's implying. And if that's the case, well, then how far off the beaten path, how, how far out of the way is the, is the church? And this is where I run into a big problem because there are separatist organizations. Uh, probably the best known one recently is run by a guy by the name of Denver Snuffer, who, uh, you know, he was teaching that, uh, you know, there are truths that the leaders of the church aren't teaching. And if you only knew these truths, you would see that you would understand that, you know, they're covering these things up. And uh, he eventually got himself excommunicated. And now he took a bunch of followers with him. And so that's what they are doing is they're trying to restore these original teachings that he believes are being suppressed. Well, how is that any different than what Jonathan Neville is asserting? So my claim, just to conclude this little part here, is that the Heartland Movement is really a gateway, a gateway drug, I guess, if you want to call it, to groups like Denver Snuffers, that it, the, the only logical direction to go in once you accept what Jonathan Neville says is out of the church, because the leaders of the church today are not teaching what he's teaching. And so when he says that we're rejecting the teachings of the prophets, well, what is it that he's doing? He's rejecting the teachings of living prophets and claiming that Joseph and Oliver were, were, were the only ones that were right and everyone else was, has got it wrong. Very dangerous. I, I, don't, I don't care for this at all. Uh, and so that's really the reason why the blog exists is to kind of you know, cast a spotlight uh, on some of these problems and my concerns about where it's headed. Do you, do you believe it would be fair to it's fine. do you believe that to, uh, it would be fair to say that taken to its consistent um, conclusion, Neville at all would have to argue that the leadership of the church and the church itself has defected publicly or apostatized to some degree? They have never said that, to the best of my knowledge. But do you think if they were there consistent, are, though, if they were consistent and they followed through on their arguments, I think that's the only conclusion that you can make is that the brethren are either stupid or evil, like I said, to, to really oversimplify things. You know, sure. they're either not aware of what's going on or they're allowing it to happen and they know it's wrong. Um, and this is one of the, really the one of the biggest problems that I have is every once in a while the mask slips and you get a comment. Uh, and let me see if I can find it on my site. This was back in January of 2021. Now, this doesn't come from Jonathan Neville. I don't want to put words in his mouth here. This is not from him. It's not from Rod Meldrum or anybody connected with the Firm Foundation, which is Rodney Meldrum's organization. It is connected with the Joseph Smith Foundation, which is a, uh, they are not a nonprofit uh, organization, but they are a uh, sort of a DBA for a, a for-profit organization. Um, uh, Kimberly W. Smith, who is the research director listed on their website, or at least was at the time that she made this comment, um, she made the comment on um, Facebook, and I have screenshots of this, uh, you know, talking about how, uh, you know, talking about problems that she has with the earth, uh, with the church, you know, will it surprise you? members of the LDS church, and especially those that know there is indeed a conspiracy, that the LDS church is in full support of that conspiracy and the agenda of global domination. And it kind of goes off in these kind of weird, you know, conspiracy. I mean, there really is a lot of weird conspiracy theory stuff in this. Um, and so uh, somebody kind of questions her about that. And she responds uh, in a comment on Facebook. Uh, to the person who commented, she says, please PM, if you will private message me, if you have any questions, the church is off course, but in all uppercase, the restoration is the miracle and the prophet Joseph Smith is the greatest prophet to walk the face of the earth, save Jesus Christ only. So here's an example of where the curtain kind of, you know, slips and you can kind of see that there's a guy that, you know, the Wizard of Oz isn't really you know, this, this great and powerful laws, it's just some guy behind a, a curtain. Well, the curtain kind of fell down here. 
for a second. And she admitted the church was off course. Well, she deleted that comment. Uh, I managed to get screenshots of it. Now, is it fair to post that comment since she deleted it? Um, you know, some people have claimed that, you know, that's not right. She took it back, et cetera. Well, yeah, it's possible she took it back, but, you know, I would say that what you saw was her real gut reaction, her real belief there, that she believes the church is off course. Um, and then she realized that the optics on that are not very good. And so she took the comment down. Do Jonathan Neville and Rod Meldrum and Ryan Nelson believe the church is off course? Uh, I don't think so. They're, they've made lots of statements where they talk about they support the brethren and so forth. But I think that there is a, uh, a contradiction between what they teach and what they, and what they assert on that matter, that their teachings, if followed to their logical conclusions, are the brethren are asleep at the switch or are permitting false doctrine to be taught. But on the other hand, they say, no, we support the brethren. You know, I, I don't think you can close that gap. I, I really don't. Yeah, and um, as I said, like, I'm glad you're, if they're inconsistent, I'm glad they're inconsistent because if they were to be consistent, as you noted, they would have to basically say in some way or another the church has defected publicly and in a great way. And that would yeah. lead up to, like, those of issues, like, uh, giving credence to, like, say, other random visionaries like Denver Snuffer and his movement and a host of other things as well. So um, for me, that's one of the greatest blasphemies of the um the more consistent um, Hurtlanders, if you will. Of course, not, not all Hurtlanders are like that. Um, Adam Stokes yes. is actually a friend of mine. He holds the Hurtland model, but he's not dogmatic about it. Um, but yeah, that that is the danger of uh, some of the more uh, consistent yet fringy movements uh, when some of these groups as well. Uh, yeah, and, and I don't think that every every Hurtlander is is kind of in this in this boat. I, there's a of lot course. of people who go to their conferences, and I think that they're kind of blissfully, uh, I don't say ignorant, that's not the right word, but they're just unaware of the the greater the deeper implications of this um you know they, they really like what they hear they you know a lot of them are very patriotic americans and so it makes uh you know kind of common sense to them that yes the book of mormon took place in the boundaries of the united states because the united states is awesome and you know we're the promised land and and so forth uh and and therefore you know it, it just kind of fits dovetails right into their pre-existing beliefs um I'll, of course, but... they'll be very disappointed to find out it's actually Ireland, not U.S. That's God's country. But... <laughs> is it the whole island, or is it just, or, or, or do we include the six counties in the north? Or uh, once the occupation's over for good, yes. the... okay. <laughs> I'm going to be clipped out of context for this now. But uh, yeah, we're, we're waiting for the great Irish reunification of 2024 that was uh, <laughs> mentioned by Lieutenant Commander Data and. In Star Trek: The Next Generation, right? It's wait, coming wait, up next year. Yeah, yeah, although that was cut from uh, the Irish and UK show, and so when he found out of about course. that a few years ago. But yeah, yeah. Uh, jo <laughs> joking aside, especially if you're a uh, fan and you're listening to this. Um, but yeah, jo joking aside. But yeah, it's like not all Heartlanders. Like most Heartlanders are like, say, I'm sure saltier people. You know, d they live very godly lives. But like some more like um, radical elements, though, it would if they were consistent, lead to like a very um very low view of the uh, nature of the church and the promise of infectability or not a great apostasy happening in this dispensation again if they were consistent and you know i'm glad they're inconsistent in this respect but a consistent uh approach would lead to like a lot of issues when it comes to see the authority of the church the sincerity of leadership and their authority as well to lead the church in um significant ways as well and I'm concerned that eventually what's going to happen is you are going to see a breakaway faction that somebody within the Heartland movement, somebody big in the Heartland movement is going to get to that point where they do a Denver snuffer and they decide to either exit the church or to make such a big deal about things that they get themselves excommunicated. And then they draw a whole bunch of people with them because they have a reasonably large following. Uh, you know, I, I got to give credit to Rod Meldrum. He has built from the ground up a fairly sizable uh, machine isn't the right word, but that's the, the idea I'm trying to get across here is that he holds twice a year a Book of Mormon Expo that runs, what, two or three days? And they get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yep. people come to this, more than admittedly to things come to like the Fairer Conference uh, and so forth that you, know, that you and I have been to, where, you know, the numbers are a little bit more modest. Um, 
and also as you know like appealing to like say american nationalism that kind of that yeah. helps as well you know no not that there's anything wrong with being nationalistic you know it can be abused but like still appealing to say nationalism uh and the um idea like say uh, the usa has a special role in god's providence um you know that kind of helps as well uh when it comes to say the yeah. enthusiasm for, as an outsider you know there's i'm unaware of any heartlander in um ireland i've ever come across but it does seem to be like a very u.s centric movement because of course it does yes. appeal to that natural sentiment and i get that you know yeah, there is a, a a strong current of nationalism within the movement, um, and I I just worry that at some point someone is either going to get excommunicated or is going to break away, and that they're just going to take a whole bunch of people with them because those people have come to believe very firmly that the Book of Mormon took place within the United States, and if the church isn't teaching this, then the church must be off course, because that's the logical, that's the end game here if you follow it to its logical conclusions. Um, otherwise, what they're doing is they're trying to kind of thread this needle of trying to say, well, we believe all these specific things, even though the brethren today really aren't teaching them, but they don't talk about how the brethren aren't teaching them. They just kind of leave it unspoken. And, you know, anybody who, you know, does the math, and we're not talking about calculus here. This is basic arithmetic, you know, one plus one, that equals the brethren, something's wrong here. And I, that that worries me. Um, so I, I I don't know where that's going to end up. So yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I'm kind of disturbed. By that. Uh, so, so any other issues you want to address before we address the uh, final uh, topic? <laughs> uh, you know, no, I I think I've gotten across. Those are my major uh, concerns. Uh, I I don't think. And, and again, maybe I can just make it clear because I haven't to this point. Is that this is not a personal thing for me with with Jonathan Neville or any other Heartlander. I, I don't have any animus toward him. I don't I don't even know him. Um, I'm focusing solely on his arguments. Is it possible that I've written some things on my blog that are a little bit kind of a little bit too, you know, going at him rather than his arguments? It is. And, and I invite people to message me with specific examples. If you find something on the blog that says, yeah, uh, Jonathan Neville is a doo doo head, you know, or whatever, you know, and that's that's over the line. Um, please let me know. I I'll take a look at it. You know, if I'm if I'm going after him personally, I I, I want to take it down, even if I can reword some things that are maybe a little bit too strong, because that's this is not a, a personal issue for me. Um, I'm just concerned about the arguments. I'm concerned about the movement. I'm kind of concerned that he's either not aware of the implications of his arguments, or he is aware of them, but he's not stating them. And I don't know which one it is. And I'm, I'm not going to come out and say that he must, he's either stupid or evil. I'm not going to do that. But that's, you know, what, what's going on here? I, I really don't know. I really don't know. Uh, fair enough. Uh, so uh, to go into our final section, uh, Mike, have yeah. you ever been to Alabama? I've never been to Alabama in my life. I uh, never have, sorry. Okay, uh, I, we should explain the uh, whole Richard Nygren affair. So uh, oh, do you want to give the TLD or before I can have, um, discuss well, how I came I, up with it? Or? Well, I, I can give you my point of view. Uh, Go ahead. And then maybe you can kind of fill in, yep. in the blanks. Uh, last summer... Uh, actually tell you what, let me give you some context and then you can go into where you came up with it. And then I'll sure. And then, and then the mounts back to me and I'll talk about what my reaction was to this. So last summer, um, a couple of interesting things happened. Um, uh, there was, I started to receive emails from somebody that I didn't know at my personal email address, me, Mike Parker, asking me if, uh, I knew who. Uh, Peter Pan was the person who ran the Neville No Land block. Uh, I didn't know who this person was, uh, and to be honest with you, it kind of it kind of freaked me out a little bit. And something I didn't address, and maybe I'll just take a, a few seconds. Sorry, I can be long winded, and I apologize to you. Oh no, it's perfect. Uh, at least we can cover like all the bases here. So <laughs> okay, um, way back at the beginning of this, I said that I started blogging um, uh, under a pseudonym, and it was mainly a joke. It, it was kind of like, hey, this is funny. This kind of fits in with the whole theme of the thing. But it eventually became, honestly, a way of of kind of shielding myself and my family from, you know, I began to draw attention from certain people 
who were a little bit scary, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm not going to name names here because that's not, I, I don't want to go there, but there's one person in particular, and then you know, a couple of others that have been a little bit more low key, but one person in particular who is just a little bit too obsessed and has been, you know, left some very, you know, kind of 15 degrees off center stuff on my, you know, comments on my website. And I eventually got to the point where I, I won't, I won't post any of his comments anymore because he's just so, uh, he, it, the stuff that he writes is disturbing. And so eventually this pseudonym that I was operating under came to be a way of providing a, a measure of protection for me and my family, because I don't want some guy to come knock on my door or show up at my workplace um, and, uh, you know, confront me. You know, I, I don't think anybody wants that. So last summer, I got this email from somebody who, no idea who they were. They said, do you know who Peter Pan is? And I got to admit that I was a little bit kind of freaked out about this because they, you know, they're emailing me. So do they have some kind of evidence that it's me? And I didn't even know what was going on. You know, was somebody, did somebody hire a private detective? You know, that's where your brain goes with these things. I have no idea what this was all about. And, you know, I responded to him and I, kind of denied it all just said you know what what are you talking about i don't know what this you know some blog what what is this all about and you know that was purely a self-defense measure a ha ha sort of a joke but also you know maybe a light way of kind of just throwing people off the scent okay so about this same time you go on an interview with spencer Krause. you have him on your program and i'll let you take over from here and then i've got some follow-up when you're done so what happened next? Yeah, sure. Just uh, as you know, like there was the context that some people, for, I think it should be no, like say since day one, I've known you were the proprietor of the uh, blog. You told me. Um, yes. Uh, so, you know, I, I was keeping a secret, um, you know, which I'm actually good at, but I kind of noticed like there was Get some- on the conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a libertarian, what do you expect? Conspiracy all the way. But, uh, you know, joking aside. But there's a lot of heat on you, and I kind of figured, like, okay, they might actually find out it's you, and who knows what they'll do. You know, some you just need one unhinged nut job on the internet to like uh, destroy you. Um, but they will also like um, one of my colleagues and one of my best friends as well, Stephen Smoot. Some people actually thought he was either Captain Hook or Peter Pan behind the blog as well, and some people actually yes. thought it was even Dan Pearson. <laughs> so I decided, yes. um, you know, it, it would be best maybe just like to make up the most random person for a Hurtlander to draw them off the scent, but to make it seem a bit plausible at the same time, just to see like, frankly, the gullibility of some ex-Mormons and also not all, but some Hurtlanders uh, as well. So I came up with the uh, surname Nygren because there was a fellow by the name of Anders Nygren who wrote a book, um, uh, Eros and the Gap Bay that I read a number of years ago. It's a well-known book in oh. the theological circles, but I also Never. was thinking like a first name, um, and around this time, I was watching like a lot of like uh, Kitchen Nightmares with uh, Gordon Ramsay, and there was like this really uh, this there was this uh, girl from the south of, uh, of the U.S. called Rochelle. And it's like that's a very random name, but I thought like instead like instead of going with Ro Rochelle, maybe go with Richard or some other male name because I think there's a rule on the internet if you don't know the gender of uh, someone you're interacting with, nine times out of ten it's male. I think there's some about law. Uh, of the internet there so but i and also we're talking about latter-day saint apologists here of which yeah 99.875 are male so you know. yeah. yeah um but also around this time uh again not all the hurt lenders are like this i want to make sure that's the case but there were some pretty racist comments made by some of the more extreme hurt lenders uh you've yeah. actually linked to one or two in your um post about richard nigren and I abhor racism, you know, and this is not the whole, uh, I can't be racist, I have black friends, but you know, I do actually abhor right. racism, I'm pretty consistent about that. So I decided like, okay, that's going to make this guy a black guy, but to make it plausible, give him like a specific location where he lived in, and I just randomly picked Birmingham, Alabama, because of course Alabama is in the Bible Belt. I think it sided with the uh, South uh, during the U.S. Uh, Civil War. So they make it a roast random team as well. So for 15 seconds, I kind of mentioned uh, the Neville Neville Land blog, which is run by Richard Nygren, the uh, of Birmingham, Alabama, one of only a few African-American apologists in the church. Just 
just to throw them off the scent of you and Smoot and Peterson. Although Smoot and Peterson have nothing to do with the blog. Um, right. And just just to troll them, but also make it plausible where they actually would think there was a Richard Nygren. And it seemed like some, including Neville, actually seemed to have believed there was indeed a Richard Nygren. On a certain discussion forum, there was like some post was like, who is this Richard Nygren fellow? You know, yes. uh, and they were looking for Richard Nygren in Birmingham, Alabama. It, it was a troll. It was a uh, spoof. That's all it is. Yes. And I trained the fact he was African-American or Black just to like really offset some of the more extreme racist aspects and segments of the Heartland movement as well. Because again, it kind of uh, fermented around that time as well. So there was some contemporary currency just to trigger them a bit more. So, yeah. and, and I think like one of the most disingenuous things is like, you know, uh, this is a racist thing. How dare these white apologists um, invent a black guy, but there was a ra- there was a reason for it. Um, it was just to trigger racists. <laughs> so uh, yeah. there you go. Uh, that that's basically the TLDR, but I'm kind of amazed how, especially in the last couple of weeks, um, it's kind of um, been blown overboard, especially by a certain uh, individual. I'm not sure if we should name his name, and a uh, fellow who currently lives in Germany who's obsessed with um, Dan Peterson as well, uh, who's pretty active on Reddit as well. So, um, oh, really? Yeah, there okay. you go. Okay. Yeah, I know who Mr. Scratchies. <laughs> oh, oh, you do? Oh, oh, you got to tell me who that is off air. I'd be very interested to know who. Uh, I'm like 99% okay. confident I know who it is. So. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and that's the funny thing is that is that on this one particular uh, message board, which is just flooded with critics of the church, I mean, really rabid critics who are just obsessed in a really, really unhealthy way. I'm not talking about people who are just critical um, of the church. I'm sorry, I've got a cat that I have to get rid of. Do you mind if oh, it's, no, just... it's fine? I'll, I'll take I'll... a second here. Sorry for the particular breaky. A cat decided to be its sociopathic self as well. Um, yes, all, all cats, not right? my cat. It's <laughs> of course it's my not a cat. <laughs> okay, so um, getting back to the 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 issue here is that uh, you know this was this was like a, a you know just a a, a one off joke that that you told is like ha ha wouldn't this be funny not thinking that it's going to get legs, not thinking that anyone's going to be obsessed about this. And so what you have is this, this message board with these obsessed people that I was talking about. They went full bore on this thing, trying to track down Richard Nygren. I mean, using, you know, doing online searches and, and people finding it like, okay, I, I found somebody named Nygren who lives in Birmingham, but I, I don't think it's the same person. I mean, they just went all in on it. And I legitimately did not expect that after you said it, that anybody was going to really get serious about this. Um, but then what ended up um, happening is that I, my understanding is that there may be some like social media accounts with that name, or maybe they're just fakes. I, I don't even know what, what this is about, but n- neither you nor I nor anybody we know has actually gone to the length of creating any social media or any profiles or using photographs of of African American individuals. This is not any of our doing. Literally a one off joke, and yeah. somebody ran with this. Yeah, I don't know uh, who it I, is. I, I've seen those profiles. I'm pretty sure, and I think like some people will um, rally a bit. It does seem to have been created after the whole Richard Nygren thing as a spoof. Once you kind of realized there was no Richard Nygren, and it was probably yeah. some kind of a joke. So, um, uh, you know, honest to God, all I did was just a troll on my podcast, and that's all I did. Um, yeah. As well as orig- in the original note, show notes, I'd said Richard Nygren's blog, uh, Neville Neville Land, you know, just be consistent that's... with what was said. Um, Some told. But yeah. But, but I have But then uh, my, my identity, my real identity got, got compromised about, what, two, two, three weeks ago. Uh, by one of the people on on these uh, on this particular message board, who you know it took it took them four years. I mean, they were convinced that it was Stephen Smoot for the longest time, and you know, just reams and reams of evidence that it's really Stephen Smoot. Um, and that turned out it was all wrong, and you know, it was just bad opsec operational security on on my part. I I used my personal Gmail account to create the blogger.com uh, blog that runs. Peter Pan. And so if you look at my, my Gmail profile, if you go to the, the Neville Land blog and you look at any of my comments and it says Peter Pan, it's linked and you click on it and it goes to my blogger profile and the blogger profile says that it's been made private. Well, somebody went to the 
uh, the Wayback Machine on Internet Archive and put it in there and found from you know 2005 or whatever that it's you know and triumphantly announced. Oh, I figured out who it is, and you know so I kind of sat on that. Somebody told me about it and I sat on it and kind of you know stewed about it for a few days and then decided uh, you know what it's already out. Let's just go ahead and make it official. And so I just went I went public on my blog and said yeah it's it's me. But where it went after that is just the just the most bizarre thing because it's not just that aha they unmasked me okay nice job guys you unmasked a guy who was operating a blog that isn't even about you and i don't even know why you care about it but then they went on to say well he's pretending to be a black man he's some kind of racist you know and he's doing all he's publishing stuff on social media and he's and i'm like you know i and i read this and i'm just like what where in the world is any of this coming from and there's one particular guy who runs a podcast, I'm not even going to deign to mention his name, who thinks that he's got something on you and I. And I guess he's going to do his podcast and, and you know reveal everything to the world. And I honestly, I'm interested to know what he's got, because everything that you and I have just discussed here in the last 10 minutes or so, that's some total. It was a one-off joke. I've never claimed to be African-American. I've never claimed to be Richard Nigren. I've never, if you look at my blog, I have one page that has the phrase Richard Nigren, and it's after all of this went down and I had to explain to the world that there's nothing there. It was just a joke. Yeah. So, but and, in today's uh, climate, you can't joke about race. That's part of the problem, is that people will destroy you if you make any kind of joke about race. That's that's what, really what this is coming down to. Yeah, and it should be no, you, never, you have never claimed to be Richard Nigren. I mean, you did query no. me as to why, and I kind of explained why. It was also like just to like trigger some heartlanders who are pretty racist at times. Again, as yeah. I said, like around that time, there's like at least two instances where like um, they did a racist, shall we say. Um, Said some things about people from Central America coming to the United States that, um, uh, and this is actually from Ryan Nelson who blogs for the firm foundation on Book of Mormon evidence dot, um, org, dot com, dot org. I can't remember off the top of my head now. Um, Ed, Ed made, he, he believes in a lot of very interesting things. Um, massive conspiracy theorists, you know, that, that COVID's a conspiracy. There's a big Jewish banking conspiracy. And, you know, he believes all the conspiracies. And he made a couple of different blog posts about, um, you know, it, it, immigrants, illegal immigrants coming from Central America, that, you know, if they were supposed to be here, God would make a way for them to come here. Just some really borderline, you know, this is not cool kind of stuff. When, you know, the church just announced, I think their sixth temple in Guatemala, you know, and, and the church officially supports not, this is their actual standpoint, is, is they do not want to see families here in the United States who are here illegally, they do not want to see families broken up and people deported back to uh, places or you know, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, wherever it is. They do not support that. They would rather have people stay here uh, and, and try to gain citizenship and keep families intact. Um, and so, you know, what Ryan Nelson said was just, whoa, okay. And I blogged about it at the time, just like, this is a little bit kind of disturbing. And so part of what you said was, yeah, in reaction to that. But, you know, if they're going to go off on this sort of racial angle, you know, maybe we need to, you know, make a little joke about, you know. <laughs> yeah. And of course, like, if you ever, and if you ever seen the movie, The Pretenders, the Irish are the Blacks of Europe. So it's okay. Uh, that, that's a joke, by the way. Um, well, no, it, it, it really is true. When yeah. when Irish uh, immigrants came to the United States in the late 19th century, early 20th century, yeah. they were looked upon as being the, the Blacks of Europe. I mean, they were considered, but, you know, many people actually openly questioned, are they actually, uh, you know, Black by, are they racially Black? And and it was, it, it, you know, we look back at that and we think about how bizarre that concept is, but that's how people thought 125 years ago. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very strange. Yeah, it's but the TLD or is like uh, it, the TLD or the whole Richard Nigren is like it was a spoof. Some people fell for it and did think there was a Richard Nigren. Um, 
I remember like him, Krauss actually told me like, oh, he once messaged me, I think, uh, or the other way around and we informed the others like, oh, cool. Neville actually referenced like a Richard who runs the uh, Neville Neville and blog and stuff like that. So that that was funny because that was the intended goal and also to throw off heat from yourself and um, the like. But yeah. it's kind of amazing how it's really um, being blown over proportion and then some in recent weeks. Uh, so Although I'm not going to lie to you, I do look forward to the uh, podcaster actually trying to uh, pronounce my actual name, not the anglicized name I use. So that'll be very interesting. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm looking at the name you have on the screen, and I can't even begin to pronounce that. I'll, there you go. How do you and say a, it? Uh, I'll I'll let the podcaster try first because apparently it's a microaggression and uh, bigotry not to be able to like pronounce a foreigner's actual name. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You know, and I'm absolutely certain that after hearing this, there's going to be people who, you know, already just detest uh, what you and I believe and uh, and detest the, the church and its leaders and Joseph Smith and the gospel who are not going to be pacified by any of this and who are just oh, going yeah. to claim that, see, this is just evidence of, you know, what what, what bigots they are and what racists they are. And, and this is just honestly, it's just part of how unhinged the discussion about race has become in in America. And, and part of it may have to do with the fact that being from Ireland in a recent, uh, you know, coming here to the United States, I, I don't know if racial sensitivities are like that in, in Ireland, but it's the United States is just a powder keg right now where you can't even say the slightest thing indicating anything about race in any way that is not even negative, but just different or or whatever, or even, you know, even an inoffensive joke without being just ripped to shreds by people. And, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not a racist. I don't believe in, in treating people differently because of race. I have always treated people with kindness because I believe that people are individuals, that they're children of God, regardless of what their skin color is, what their country of origin is, what their ethnicity is. I, I just I simply don't hold to any of these collectivist views of uh, you know that that some people are better than others uh, just because of their you know ethnic origin or whatever. I, I think it's a load of crock. Yeah. But we live in a world today where that's becoming pretty much the foundation of our society. Is yeah, uh, uh, yeah. And racism and is you, everywhere. Yeah, and the way is like um you know and I'm pretty. Uh, and I'm being pretty consistent over the years, and I've mentioned this a number of times. But podcast, like I actually believe the temple and priestly restriction to be based on 19th century racism and was a mistake. So you no, know, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you're not going to find like a white nationalist who's actually in, in the church who's actually ever going to say that. So yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, I thought we kind of nipped that in the bud. Um, although you know, idiots will be That's, idiots, and no matter what, it's you just do, fanning uh, the flames, probably. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're just going to know they're going to clip some of this and kind of take it out of context, including their uh, little uh, PowerPoint for next week or whenever. But um, I'm kind of morbidly curious as to how that will go down. But no, that be does me. But uh, uh, Mike, uh, we've actually been on for a while now. But um, yeah, so yeah any, thank you for the time. Oh, no. So like any other final comments? And also like when it comes to, say, Book of Mormon geography, is there like any particular book or books you would recommend for anyone who may want to study, let's say, the Mesoamerican model as opposed to the Heartland model? Um, if, ooh, and again, I'm not an expert in this area. I, you know, I kind of fall in the Mesoamerican camp, but I'm not the, uh, the biggest, uh, expert on it. Probably the, um, one of the standard work on this would be, uh, John Sorensen's, um, an ancient American setting for the book of Mormon. Yeah. I think that is still in print, at least in paperback. Uh, this is a hardcover edition. It was published in 85 originally. That's probably the go-to on that one. And then uh, where's the one by Palmer? Here it is. This one is also, I uh, haven't read it all the way through, but there's one by uh, David Palmer called In Search of Kimura. Um, those are two very popular sure. ones. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I necessarily recommend them, but I think that if you want to know about the Mesoamerican uh, geography theory, uh, those would probably be, I'd, I'd start with Sorensen, I think, uh, yeah. an approach, uh, sorry, in a, an ancient American setting for the Book of Mormon. Yeah, is, 1985. That book. You could yeah. probably get a used copy on Amazon for, you know, not a lot. There's a lot, a lot of copies of it around. 
Yeah, no, no, that's perfect. I just thought I um throw in some uh, book recommendations being a bibliophile um, of sorts. But uh, yeah, th thanks again for uh, coming on. And in the show notes, I include a link to your blog as well as uh, the interview I had with Spencer Krauss. Also include the uh, link to the um, self discussion on uh, the B.H. Roberts Foundation website as well, just because it was referenced here. But uh, thanks again for coming on uh, from St. George, not Alabama, uh, Birmingham. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, well, thank uh, you. I, I, I no, appreciate the pleasure. time and and I appreciate the offer to come on and and kind of talk about some of this stuff. Oh no, that's perfect. And um, oh, hopefully uh, we can actually have you on some other time as well. I'm hoping to do like a um, maybe an episode or a live stream where we can have uh, me and a few others discuss like um, Star Trek and maybe the either theology or anthropology, yeah. or, like say some Star Trek episode, not not yeah. Star Trek Five because that never happened, right? No, I'm I'm telling you, we got to watch that together. <laughs> I'm telling you, just do, do a Mystery Science Theater 3000 uh, on that. <laughs> next time we're together, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can make it happen. Well, hopefully hopefully in the next few weeks we can make that happen. But uh, again, thanks for your time. And um, everyone should check out the uh, Neville Neville Land uh, blog uh, for um, some very good discussion about um, uh, the problems with Neville's approach to various topics. So and okay. again, thanks for your time, Mike. And um, thank you. Happy, hope you and your family have a great Easter. Same to you. Thanks.